Hey, what's going on, you beautiful people? My name's Tie-Dye. I hope you guys had a pretty awesome day today. My day's been pretty awesome so far. So in today's video, what I want to do is bring you guys a tutorial on how to make some nice professional looking renders using a program called Marmoset Toolbag. Now, this is a real-time rendering program, and it's used to show off game assets primarily, but you can use it for other stuff as well. It's a pretty simple program, and we're going to go through that. So uh, the reason I wanted to do this was because a couple weeks ago, I was lucky enough to go down to Ubisoft Toronto, and I had a portfolio review, and the guy I was talking to was very very insightful gave me a lot of great feedback and a lot of things I could improve on and one of the main things that he told me that I should be working on is how I'm rendering stuff out and the actual overall presentation of my assets so what I did recently was I went through every single one of my portfolio pieces here and I went through and I changed how I was showing everything off so just as an example um, here as you can see I have some group shots just so I can uh, show everything off really really quickly but this is what I'm gonna be teaching you guys today just sort of breaking this down, having a, a simple render uh, with a bunch of different angles, showing off the wireframe, just a really sort of, you know, clean looking uh, way to show off some of your more major assets. Um, this can be used for a group of stuff or it could be used for a single asset like I'm showing off here. And I've been really, really enjoying this style. It was inspired by some other people. I've been watching a bunch of different tutorials to get to know uh, different rendering softwares and ways to show stuff off recently. So I'm going to be putting some links in the description if you guys want to look into that even further. But um, yep, I pretty much went through and changed everything here, as you can see. For uh, single assets, I uh, went through and did a bunch of different angles. But then things for like entire scenes, I would relight it and then sort of do a... a um, a promo video like this one here so I thought that was pretty cool and then I'm also going to be showing you how to not only make these sort of three point or, or, or two way renders and all of that stuff and put it together in Photoshop but once you're done that I'm going to show you how to make this uh, 3D viewer as well so you can take your render and then take a 3D model of it and plop it in as well so this is pretty much showing you how to make a really really nice looking portfolio um, compilation here for something like ArtStation and the 3D viewer is just going to be an extra thing that you can add in there just in case someone wants to say look at your wireframe or specifically look at uh, I don't know let's say your albedo map or something like that so super super useful stuff um, if you're going to be showing off your portfolio in a professional setting this is the kind of stuff that they're going to be wanting to see and uh, yeah hopefully you guys enjoy this we're going to dive into it right now so I'm going to be showing you pretty much the basics of this program, but we're also going to be making some really nice looking renders. We're going to be starting from scratch, so pretty much the first thing I'm going to do is I have this folder here, and uh, this is going to be where I have a bunch of my assets. Um, these are all stuff that I've already done before. But essentially, I want to show this off on a pretty simple object just so that you guys can you know, get use of everything. I'm assuming um, the people watching this have some experience with this program, but if not, I'm going to be going through the very, very basics of it. So I'm going to be demonstrating on a chalkboard asset. So I'm just going to be dragging that in. It's an FBX file, but OBJs work perfectly fine as well. And as you can see, it brought in the material that was assigned to it in Maya. Um, I'm not going to really want that right now. It was just a you know, a checker material to see if the UVs were working fine. Uh, I'm actually just going to go ahead and delete all of my materials here. It's a very, very basic model. Um, the first thing I'm going to do before I do any of the lighting or any of the rendering is put on the material that I made using Substance Painter. So to add a new material, I'm going to hit the little plus button. You could, of course, add your maps to the default one, but if you have multiple assets, it's going to assign it to everything until you add more material uh, into your scene. So what I'm going to do is hit the plus button, we're just going to call this chalkboard just to sort of keep things a bit more organized. Um, it's just going to be a bit more simple that way. And now what I'm going to do is go in and find my images for that, my texture files here. And there we go. So these are my images for it. I'm just going to put it off to my other monitor for now. And essentially all we have to do is drag them into the corresponding um, uh, locations here under the material and just for those of you who are, are brand new to this program I'm going to go over some of the navigation uh, techniques here so it's the exact same as Maya and as Substance Painter if you're a Max user this might be a bit different for you but uh, essentially all you want to do is hold alt and left click to sort of rotate around the scene alt and middle mouse to sort of pan around like this and alt and right click to zoom in and out uh, very similar to Maya or Substance Painter, like I said. So if you're uh, familiar with 3D, if you've gotten to the point where you have a 3D model that's textured, you should be used to these commands. But it's very, very simple, easy to pick up, um, and you guys should have no problem with that. If you do, of course, just 
fumble around with it, practice with it. Uh, there might be a way to sort of change the controls to be similar to a different program. But as far as I can tell, um, this is kind of like the universal 3D navigation. So you guys should be fine with that. Anyways, let's get back to putting together our actual material here. And as we go along, we're going to go through more of these settings and it's going to be uh, pretty much all covered. It's a pretty simple program. So we will be going through the majority of pretty much everything that we can use at our disposal here. So as you can see, the first thing that we have is a normal map. So I'm just going to be dragging in my normal map right there. And as you can see, nothing changed it's because we haven't actually applied the material to here yet. Uh, we're going to be doing that once it's all put together. So the next thing that we see is gloss map. Now, we don't actually have a gloss map because we were using roughness maps, metallic maps, uh, base color and normal pretty much the, the standard maps that you'd be using in a game. But this is kind of a weird program in the sense where it uses some of these older maps like gloss and specular. Now with gloss, what we can do is we can just put our roughness into there. And if we invert it, that is now our roughness map. Yep. So you just got to put your gloss in, or uh, roughness into gloss and invert it. And you should be good that way. It's a bit weird. I don't know exactly why they don't have just a roughness channel. Um, it is kind of behind the times in that sense. Uh, next thing we're going to do is drag our base color into albedo. Albedo is pretty much interchangeable with just base color. Uh, for specular, what we're going to do is actually click this little drop down arrow and bring down metalness. Uh, so we can actually just completely change it out for our metallic map. I'm going to put mine right in there. And the last thing I want to do is we have a bunch of options down here. For example, occlusion and emissive. Say if you had something glowing on there, you had an emissive map, what you could do is hit the drop down, click emissive and drop your, uh, your map into there. Same with transparency, anything like that. But of course, for something like a chalkboard, I don't really have that. But what I do have is an occlusion map. So I'm going to go hit the little drop down arrow beside occlusion, click on occlusion and drag in my ambient occlusion map. We're going to drag that onto our chalkboard. And now we have our working material. Now, as you can see, this looks pretty bad compared to the render that I had before on my ArtStation page. Um, just to sort of quickly get a better look at this, if you hold shift and right click, you can rotate the sky around, which is going to be pretty helpful later on when we're lighting things up a little bit more. Um, but to affect the sky, what we're going to be doing is on the left here, as you can see, we have everything that we have inside of our scene. We have the entire scene itself, our renderer, which we're going to go into later on, our main camera, which is the camera that we're using to view this, the sky, which is uh, one of the main light sources that we're using here. If I turn that off, for example, it's pitch black and the chalkboard itself. And as you can see, when I click that, it shows the object that I'm using and underneath there's the poly group for it. So say I had multiple um, assets that I exported as one FBX, you'd see them all individually here with their own names. Or for example, it would be a great way to separate different meshes if you had a bunch of different texture groups for things that way you could just easily select it that way. Um, but what we're going to be using right now is just the sky. So I can increase the brightness, um, I can rotate it, I can do a bunch of different stuff. But essentially what this sky is, it's an HDRI image. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's essentially just a, a 3D image. And uh, based on where the light sources are in that image, we get light put onto our scene here. Um, pretty much most 3D programs use this. All games use this. Uh, Unreal Engine has a, a series of HDRI images as well. And what we're going to be doing is going through the presets for this and just changing our, our very basic lighting to something that looks a little bit better. So I've noticed that just off of these, these predetermined sample HDRIs here, the ones that I really like is Museum. I think that has a really nice sort of uh, lighting to it. Very, very warm, especially for an object like this where you'd want it to be pretty warm. And uh, Castle Sunset is also very nice. Um, but of course, experiment with all of these. For example, if you have something that's a bit cooler, you might want something like uh, late day field. Um, or if you're going for something that's more of like a jungly theme, uh, forest path would probably be a much better choice for you. But I'm going to stick with museum for this one and uh, find a nice angle that I think looks good. I really don't want to use the skylight too much. I want to depend more on the own lights that I'm that I'm adding into the scene. But uh, you do want to have a bit of like an ambient skylight going on. So I'm going to draw the brightness a little bit on that. And another thing that I like to do just when I'm working um, is actually change this background color. I find it really distracting when I have this weird gradient uh, blurry background going on. So what you can do is in the sky settings, you can go to mode and change it from ambient sky to color. And we're still going to get the exact same uh, uh, lighting effects from the sky. But essentially now we can just change it to be uh, a, a solid color that isn't going to be so distracting. And just when I'm working on this kind of stuff, I want to be focusing just on the asset, right? So I am going to be dropping the saturation and the brightness of the background. 
to something like that, just so we can focus on the asset that we're working with here. And of course, you can make the background whatever you want. When I'm actually rendering this out, I'm going to be taking away the background completely and just making it transparent. Uh, that way, it's going to be easier to work with in Photoshop. So if you want to, you can have a blurred sky, ambient sky. You can just have the full on sky like that if you want, uh, whatever you're comfortable working with. But I just prefer color for the specific uh, type of work here. So the next thing we want to do is just add some basic lights and then we're going to go through the render settings. Um, Another thing I want to bring up is with some of these material settings like occlusion, I'm just going to tinker with this for a little bit, there are sliders. So emissive and occlusion definitely have sliders. What I can do is go through here and affect how much of the occlusion is actually coming through with that map. Uh, it was on all the way, 100% before I believe. I'm going to bring that down just a little bit, uh, maybe to like 0.7 or something like that, just because I think it was a bit too powerful, and I think that's looking a lot better. Um, so we are going to drop in our lights now. So just by clicking this little light icon up in the top left, I can add a light to the scene. This is the same way we add cameras, uh, we open our baker, um, a bunch of different stuff like that. We can just import models that way as well. But we're just going to be adding a light to the scene for now. And I'm just going to be doing a very, very basic three-point lighting setup here. Uh, it's pretty much a standard way to light a, a single object. And the theory behind it is you have two lights in the front, one in the back for a rim light. And uh, it's a pretty good way of showing stuff off. So I'm just going to essentially have two lights, one on each side here. I don't want them to be too, too powerful or anything like that. And uh, let's just go over some of the light settings here. So the light that I'm using right now is an Omni light. And this is essentially just a, a sphere that's emitting light. Um, but it has a certain distance to it. Uh, if we go to directional, it is pretty much just mimicking the sun. So it's just going to cast a very, very powerful light. Um, in whichever angle this uh, white line is showing. Uh, the next one is spotlight, pretty self-explanatory, a light that shoots out in a cone like a spotlight. And those are our three different types of lights. I'm just going to stick to Omni for now, though. And uh, re-rotate this back. Not that it would really matter. I just want to keep the uh, axes sort of lined up here. Um, and we do have quite a few settings to work with here. Obviously, brightness is going to affect how bright things are. Distance is going to affect how far our light actually affects things. So say you had a very long object and you just wanted the front of it to be lit and the back of it to be very, very dark. Uh, you could just sort of bring the distance down and the back wouldn't be lit. Um, and the rest of these settings, I really don't tinker with too much. Maybe shape, just in case you have like a really weird object you want to work with. Uh, but most of the stuff you're really not going to touch, especially for a simple render like this. Um, the only other thing that I do want to do, though, is change the color of this light. Now, one of the things you want to keep in mind when you're lighting something is white light like this, like pure white light, as far as we're concerned, doesn't really exist. We have never really come in contact with 100% pure white light. So uh, when rendering things and you, when you want to make them look really realistic, you want to tint it just the slightest bit of a, a color. And in most cases, lights are tinted a bit yellow or a bit orange, maybe just like 10%, not even, uh, just to keep it a bit more realistic in that sense. So I'm going to have this light here. And it's looking pretty good. One of the other things you can do is, is of course, get rid of cast shadows. But um, that's sort of very dependent on whatever you're working on. Sometimes you'll find it'll look better that way. I like to keep certain shadows. Uh, I just hit Control D there to duplicate this light. As you can see, I added a second one here. So there's light one, light two, because Control D was to uh, duplicate it there. I'm just going to bring this up and uh, move it up a little bit and move this one down a little bit. I'm gonna drop the brightness on this one because I want it to seem like they're both lit, but one side definitely has more light shining on it. So just based off of these lights alone, this was just the skylight and these are the lights that we've added. Let's just sort of tinker with this a bit and see if we can get something good looking out of this. So just based off of that, we definitely have a brighter top left, but this is still very well lit. And um, we'll probably go back and change that a little bit. But uh, what I want to do is now add our rim light to the back. So just clicking that little light bulb again and dragging in a light. I'm going to put it in the back. And uh, oh, this is another thing I want to bring up. So as you can see, when we're trying to look through the back of this mesh, uh, we can't actually see it. And this is because the back faces are culled. So the way that we can get through that is if you click on your mesh, you're going to get your sort of mesh uh, settings here. We have cast shadow checked and cull back faces. If I uncheck that, we can now look through the back and obviously it's just a mirrored version, right? So for this asset specifically, it wouldn't be very useful, but say you have something like a, 
a Coke can and you want to look down the, the opening of it, um, you wouldn't be able to unless you turned off call back faces. So in case you want to look at something that's just like a single plane and you want to be able to see it, uh, you should definitely uncheck that. But for this, I'm just going to you know keep them called. We really don't need to see through this or anything like that. Um, but just in case you were wondering where that was, it's just by yeah clicking on the mesh and those settings will come up. So um, let's just go back. I'm going to bring this light in again. And the first angle, I just sort of want it to be straight on. And as you can see, uh, the light is shining through this, um, which is a bit weird. If I called the back faces, though, it's not shining through. So that's another thing right there. Since I have actual geometry rendering on the back side here, the light is actually being affected by it. So I'm going to keep actually the I'm going to stop calling the back faces so you can see through and so the light is actually affected by those polygons. Um, and going back to this light here, once again, we can't just have a pure white light. I'm actually going to make this one a bit of a cooler color because this is going to be for the rim light. And I'm going to bring it up and bring it to the side maybe. And let's just find a good angle where it's just reflecting subtly around the corner here. Let's see. Should I bring the brightness up? I'm just trying to find like the, the perfect balance where it's just yeah, reflecting off the edge like that. Something something like that. Nothing too too powerful, but just a very subtle uh, way of going about that. Um I'm going to turn off the casting shadows of the of the brighter light as well. It was actually casting a shadow in here, which I wasn't too uh, too fond of. So I'm going to turn that off as well. And for this, I'm actually going to drop how much uh, blue is in this light a bit, just so it's a bit more bright. Um, just trying to get like a nice rim light there. I don't want it to be like too overwhelming. But I do want it to be pretty noticeable as well. So maybe something like that. So this is like our very, very basic lighting setup and it still doesn't look too, too good. And that's because what we have to do now is go into our render settings here and we're gonna change a lot of the settings that are actually gonna really pump up the quality of this render. So I'm gonna go to my render uh, renderer right here. We wanna change a couple things. Uh, the very first thing that we have here to work with is resolution. It says 1-1. One, one. Now, this is something we really wanna change before we render things out at the end, but I'm just gonna turn it on now to show you guys. Um, essentially what we can do is hit 2-1 and double it and it's literally just going to double our quality. It's going to it's going to double the amount of pixels that we're working with here. And the reason you don't want to turn this on until later on is because it, it straight up doubles um, how much you're rendering at once. So it's, it's really good, but um, it's going to make it a lot more demanding on your computer. So what I'd recommend is turning it on right before you render things at the end. So for now, I'm going to go back and put it on 1-1. One, one, but uh, we will be turning that back to 2-1 before we render things out because it's going to make things look a lot better, literally twice as better as it could uh, look. So very, very important setting to have on. Um, next, what we're going to be doing is, let's see, high DPI. We're going to turn that on. None of this stuff we really have to touch. Going down to scene, if you do want to show off your wireframe, you can do that. Of course, you can change the opacity with the slider and the color of it. We're not going to be doing that for this specific render. Uh, lighting is a very, very important one. Local reflections you definitely want to have on. Now, you're not going to see it too much on this, but say you had a, a rounded metallic object um, where light is reflecting off of itself. It's going to make that uh, look a lot better. It's um, definitely a very important thing to have on. I'm just going to check it on anyways, just in case there's some small micro details that are going to pop up. Uh, high res shadows. You're going to turn that on. You're going to get much better looking shadows. Ambient occlusion. Of course, we want that on. And uh, we actually have a slider here to work with to affect our ambient occlusion. I know we had an actual map for that, but um, the map was just doing some of these details in here, right? So what we can do is actually add in our ambient occlusion and just sort of adjust it here. It's really not making too much of a difference. There's a, there's a really subtle difference that I can see, but nothing too major. You can see it if you look right along the uh, edges right here. Very, very subtle. You're going to see a lot. Uh, a lot better in areas that have sort of like tight corners and um, a lot of places that that I don't know aren't so flat like this it's harder to see something like that with something so flat so there is a bit of a difference with that and I do like what it is doing so I'm going to keep that on another really really important setting is global illumination so what you can do is hit enable GI 
and uh, it's really going to change the overall quality of the quality of the lighting. It's going to be putting light into a bunch of these sort of crevices and stuff. You can affect the brightness of things, and uh, it's just going to add a very very nice lighting, uh, pretty much over top of everything. It's going to look really good. You can sort of um, disable things you don't want it to affect, such as specular or diffuse. Diffuse, of course, being your color. And then you want to pretty much always crank up your quality to four times. Uh, essentially, if you're trying to make good looking renders, you want this to look as good as possible. Always sort of raise the settings as high as you can. But a global illumination is just sort of adding, as you can see here in the edges, very subtle, but it's turning it from just like a total shadow to an actual sort of like lit object. Uh, nothing is completely dark anymore as soon as we add in global illumination, which is looking really, really good. And then another setting that we have here is you can use the watermark. Um, we don't really need to do this. You can always, of course, add this in later in Photoshop. But uh, the point of this essentially is that Marmoset Tool Bag 3 is a real-time renderer. And if you can show off your assets in this, it means it pretty much is good to work in a game. Not all the time, obviously, but uh, it's a pretty good indicator that it's a game-ready asset. So um, showing things off in Tool Bag is pretty impressive. And uh, people like to see sometimes that you're using real-time renderers rather than something like Arnold or V-Ray, right? So that's pretty cool if you do want to just quickly throw that on right there. But uh, for this, we're not going to be doing that. So the next thing I want to do is go into the camera settings underneath the renderer. And there are a couple things we can change in here as well. Of course, there's like the focus, flare, distortion. Focus, if you do want to have some depth of field, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, we're not going to really do this because it's a pretty flat object. Um, flare, if you have any optical flares that you want to add in. Of course, for something like this, we don't need that. And distortion, you can do some cool stuff with this. Um, one of the very, very popular features of something like this would be chromatic aberration. Uh, you've probably seen it a million times if, you, if you've looked through renders, but it's essentially when you sort of get this, these um, like blurred out edges where the RGB channels are, are starting to split. I do like that as well. It is pretty overdone, so if you're going to do it, I'd recommend doing it very, very sparingly. Like, I'll put it on, but I want it to be very, very subtle. Um, and I recommend you do the same. Then, of course, you can affect each individual channel here. Post effects, you can change things such as the exposure, uh, which I'm not going to do, contrast, um, contrast center, saturation, stuff like that. Of course, all that stuff I'd prefer to change in Photoshop, and I'd recommend you do as well, because you're going to have much more control over it. I'm actually going to drop the chromatic aberration a little bit more. Uh, sharpen, of course you can change this in Photoshop as well, but you might as well just put a little bit of that on right now. I'm just going to do maybe like 0 0.005. Of course you can add a limit to it as well. Bloom, this is a pretty important one, so this essentially sort of like softens the light on everything. And this kind of looks silly right now, but... um. If you have an emissive map and you're noticing that your emissive map isn't really generating as much light as you'd like, uh, putting the bloom up is definitely going to make that look a lot better. So keep that in mind. Sometimes when you put an emissive map on, it looks kind of underwhelming. It's probably because your bloom settings aren't as high as they should be. Uh, the next thing you can do is add a vignette. I always like vignettes. It just sort of like darkens the corners, just sort of gives you something to focus on in the center. I'm going to raise the softness up and drop this down a little bit. So as you can see, we're already sort of like really focused in on the middle now. And a grain. And the grain essentially sort of like, it's pretty self-explanatory, but it adds a grain to everything. And the reason you'd want to do that is because the vignette sometimes, um, since it's, trans it's transitioning between a, a really dark and a lighter version of that color, you sometimes get these lines between the transition. And it looks really, really un you know, un unpleasing. Um, the grain though, what it does is it adds some noise in there and it sort of gets rid of that sort of like tearing in those lines. So sometimes when you do have a vignette and you notice that there's some lines going on in the corners here, put a little bit of grain, not too much, but just a little bit, and it's going to look a lot better that way. And as you can see, our, our object here is already starting to look a lot better. This looks pretty good right now. So... I think we're, we're, we're probably ready to actually render this out. This rim light isn't looking as good as I'd like it to. I might, let's see. It's hard just because of the angle of all of this. But it is getting its job done, I guess. It is, it is catching some light there. I think something like that would probably look a bit better though, right? Okay, so I'm just going to line this up. And of course, you can do things like animations in this program as well. If you import an object with animation attached to it, uh, you can affect it down here. But we're not going to be going into that in this video. 
Eh, let's just see. Okay, I'm liking that for sure. So I'm just going to line this up as best as I can to take up as much screen space. I'm going to go back to our renderer now and make sure that our resolution is set to double, which is going to double our quality. Things are looking pretty crispy right now. And uh, let's actually go into our render settings to see what we're going to be exporting here. So we're going to go to capture. And as you can see, my program is starting to lag a little bit just as soon as I uh, double the resolution. It's the render settings that really, really uh, make this program great, but they are pretty demanding. I'm not going to lie. So we're going to go to settings here. And the settings that I want to be using when capturing an image is I want to have PNG and I want to have transparency on. And the reason I want that is so the, the entire background here when I export it won't be there. Uh, I can just bring it in Photoshop, start working with it, manipulate things, put it in front of other objects. It's going to look really good. Uh, to sort of have the transparency working, we have it as PNG. Sampling, now this is really important. Um, essentially, the sampling is going to control how good the sort of like deep shadows and the lighting is going to look. So, for example, pockets of shadow are going to look very, very um, speckly with a lot of black dots if we have low samples. So the higher the samples, the better it looks. That being said, if you put it on like 400 samples, it straight up might just crash. Uh, for me, I put it on 100 samples, and even though I have a pretty decent computer, uh, it does take quite a while to render. It would probably take me about, I don't know, three, four minutes to render. Um, but I do like the quality of 100. That is my, my personal favorite. I'm going to put it on 25 just for the sake of this tutorial because it'll probably take a, a too long if I have it set to 100. Um, and then for the actual image size, what I'm going to do is instead of doing a 1920 by 1080, typically I do 3840 by 2160. Uh, I feel like that's just super, super crisp, especially with 100 samples. It's going to look really, really good. Uh, I'm going to set it to uh, 2560 by 1440, though, for this example, just for the sake of this tutorial. Of course, experiment, whatever you guys want, you can go for that. I'm just going to hit OK here. And I'm going to go and hit Capture and Image. Uh, actually, before I do that, I'm going to save my file because it might crash. And it's something that does happen. So I'm just going to call this one, two, three, and uh, save that to the desktop. So be very, very wary of that. This program will crash if you tell it to do more than it can do. Um, it's totally not out of the question. So I'm going to try and render this out, and I will talk to you guys once it is done, because hopefully it doesn't take too long. But uh, yeah, you just got to go go to go uh, to capture, image, and then it'll render it out and put it on your desktop for you. All right, so it should be done. And one of the things that I forgot to mention is sometimes when you render it, it says in the top left, not responding. Uh, typically when I render stuff, it crashes for a little bit, but then if you wait it out, it'll still come out. And uh, as you can see, this is the render that we got from our object. I'm pretty happy with that. Of course, like I said, I'd like to boost the quality more typically when doing this, but uh, very, very basic rim light, some nice soft light here. Uh, overall, well lit, showing off the, the textures pretty simply. Um, it's a pretty simple render, but I'm pretty happy with it at the same time. You could also sort of do more of a dynamic pose and have like an angle or something, which would be an easier way to show off a rim light like this, as well as these uh, shadows. But I'm kind of happy with it the way it is right now. Um, in fact, you know, I'm going to render at a different angle just to sort of show you guys how I'd set up a Photoshop scene with multiple angles. So I'm going to render this one out, and I will talk to you guys when this render is done as well. All right, so the second render is done, and what we're going to do now is dive into Photoshop. I'm using CS6. You can use pretty much any version for this. It's uh, nothing too, too crazy that we're doing here. So I'm just going to drag this in so we get the resolution that we want. And I'm going to drag in the second one as well, just so we can uh, all have it in one scene here. Um, so these are in here. I'm going to hit Control-T to sort of just like get these into position. I'm going to drag it pretty close to the edge. And then the second one, I'm going to hit Control-T, just give it a little bit of breathing room there. Um, and while we're in this sort of um, 
main window, what I want to do is set up the actual way the scene is going to look. So I'm going to hit this little button here underneath the magic wand to crop this image. Um, just to sort of give us a better sort of document size to work with. Holding Alt, I'm going to drag up so it's even on both sides. And just sort of bring this in a little bit. I'm pretty happy with, uh, with the way that looks. I might give it a bit more space. And an easy way to sort of, you know, make this uh, a bit more centered is to drag out your grid. So if you don't have these these grid lines here, you can hit Control R to bring up your grid. I'm just going to drag this down to the middle and um, grab. Let's see. I'm going to drag another grid line so we have it sort of centered here. I'm going to select both of these images, Control T, and make sure they're directly in the middle as well. So that's good. Everything's centered. Um. I might even grab these and spread them out a little bit more and then grab them both again to make sure it's centered and I like that there's some good breathing room between everything here uh, so what I want to do is add a new layer here put it in the background and we're just gonna sort of make a solid color background I want it to be pretty dark like a dark gray or something like that so we're just gonna fill that in um, just to really make it pop. And if you hit Control U on this background layer, we can just sort of adjust the brightness on the spot here, just in case you want to tinker with it a little bit. Um, something like that's looking good to me. I'm pretty happy with that. And what I want to do now is sort of add some variation in the background. So I'm going to go to my, my shape tool, my rectangle tool here. And I'm going to have a bit of a brighter square in the background. So we're just going to drag that out center that up and holding alt once again we're going to lift this up just to sort of have this main shape in the background and we want the um we want these these signs to sort of go over top of it like i don't want it to be like this or anything like that it's really important that when you are adding something like this where you don't want these lines to line up like the line of your object with the line of this rectangle it's just going to look really uncomfortable really awkward so what i want to do is have it like cutting into it a little bit even just like that just to sort of have some difference and uh, I'm going to right click and rasterize that layer so I'm liking how that looks I'm going to adjust the lighting though a little bit so I'm going to drop that down I don't want this line to be too noticeable maybe something like that the next thing I want to do is add some drop shadows to everything just to sort of make it pop a little bit more uh, so for this rectangle I'm going to go to effects and drop shadow I'm going to angle it at about, let's see, 120, add some distance to it, some size just to make it a bit bigger, and drop the opacity. I just want a very, very light shadow uh, at the bottom there, nothing too crazy. You might even drop the size a little bit. Something like that I think is looking pretty good. Uh, I'm also going to add a stroke, just a black stroke, maybe like two pixels nothing too noticeable and drop the opacity on that just to sort of make it a bit crisper so it's very very subtle but uh, I think it does make quite a difference and the last thing I want to do is add a gradient overlay and just drop the opacity on that way down to like four or something like that and that's all I want for that rectangle I'm also gonna let's see control U once again and drop the oh no not the opacity the uh, the lightness of it to something like that I'm liking the look of that. And another thing I want to do is add in some noise to it by adding in um, just some dust particles. So I'm going to type in dust overlay. And we're going to find some, some pretty simple stuff here. Uh, nothing too crazy. Let's just try and find something to just sort of break up the, uh, the solid colors. Um, this is one that I like, actually. This is pretty good looking. So I'm going to copy this image. And from here, I'm going to go... Make sure the rectangle is selected. Control V. We're going to have this dust overlay here. We can just blow this up because we're not really going for any of the details in this. Uh, I'm making sure to sort of make it extra big because I'm not too big of a fan of this specific dust particle. I think it's too big. So I'm just going to keep zooming in until that's out. Of course, you can alter this image. Uh, you can go over it in black and get rid of things. Um, but I really don't mind losing a bit of quality on this since this really is not the focus and you're not going to be seeing any quality loss because we're going to change it quite a bit. 
Um, what I want to do though is add a clipping mask so that this layer is on top of this rectangle. And the way that we're going to do that is by having this, this dust layer directly on top of the rectangle, I can now hold Alt and if I middle or if I if I mouse between the two of them, as you can see, I get this special icon. And I'm still holding Alt. And if I click between the two, now I have this dust overlay just affecting this rectangle layer, which is uh, pretty sweet. This is super super useful. You can use this for a ton of stuff. And uh, with this done, I can change this uh, blend type to screen. So we got rid of all the black, and I'm just going to lower the opacity quite a bit, maybe to something like four. And as you can see, we just have this like very very subtle dust going on in the background. Um, which breaks up a lot of the just the plain looking rectangle. I like that. I'm gonna hit Control J to duplicate it once again, holding Alt, clipping mask down to the rectangle, and I'm just gonna hit Control T and rotate it just to get a bit more variation. And uh, I think that's looking pretty good. So I might even drop the uh, lightness of this rectangle, something like that. So yeah, we're getting some noise in there. It's looking pretty good. Uh, I do want to add some drop shadows to these actual renders that we made as well. So super simple, click on it, uh, effects, drop shadow, distance. I want these to be really subtle as well. I just want them, I don't really want them to be noticeable, but I want them to sort of have like a subtle, like, I want them to break them up from the background, it's a sense. Like this is a not, not very noticeable shadow, as you can see, like if I turn it on and off, but it's enough to break it up from the background. That's why I'm dropping the opacity. That's why I'm making the size very, very soft. Uh, same thing for this one on the top here. So adding in a drop shadow, I'm going to add some distance, blow up the size so it's a lot softer, and then drop the opacity to something like 34. So that's looking pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, the next thing that I want to do is I'm going to add sort of like my own vignette to this. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is adding a new layer here. With my brush on, I'm going to make sure my brush is fully black. And there's other ways to do this that are probably a bit more precise. But making sure that my hardness is on zero and my uh, color is on black, I'm just going to go to these edges and just paint in a bit of a vignette here. So it's really dark on the edges. I might even for this specific one uh, make my brush size bigger and just sort of get a really nice vignette in here and uh, the reason I have this below the chalkboard layer is because I really really want these chalkboards to pop so I have it just above the rectangle but below the chalkboards and uh, from here I can set this to overlay and just drop the opacity down quite a bit as you can see it's making things pop but I think actually what I've done wrong here is I made it too big now so I'm just going to get rid of that I'm just trying to find like the perfect mix here. Um, I think maybe this size will do it. Yeah, I just want the edges to, to appear darker. Something like that. As you can see, it just makes everything pop a little bit more. I'm quite a big fan of that. You don't need to make it too, too extreme, but uh, that definitely seems to be working for the sake of this scene. I am liking that quite a bit. Um, what we could do right now is actually go into these individual objects and, and hit them with a, a sharpen by clicking it, going to filter and sharpen. But I think I'm actually quite happy with how sharp this is just based off the render that we uh, got. I'm pretty cool with that. Um, what we do want to do though is change some of the coloring and the lighting though to this. So the first thing I want to do is add a levels to the scene. So we're going to do that by clicking this little half and half circle down here and going to levels. And we want to make sure this is at the very top so it's affecting everything. And as you can see, um, what I want to be doing here is uh, sort of bringing in the blacks. So as you can see, it's sort of darkening everything a little bit. We're getting rid of those really, really bright brights. And on the opposite end, we also have the uh, opposite effect going on if we bring in this arrow. It's just sort of bringing all the colors together a little bit. And we're using more of the spectrum this way. Um, you want to be able to use the entire full spectrum. As you can see, we're not really utilizing everything that, that we could here between black and white. So by bringing these together, even if it's just by a little bit, we're using more of the spectrum to its entirety. Uh, you want to be able to use it as best as you can. You want your scene to be really intricate with uh, light lights and dark darks. And just by doing that, um, we're getting a bit closer to that goal. And then we have this middle slider that we can affect to see which we like a bit more. Um, 
it was pretty good the way it was but if i bring it a little bit closer to the white side as you can see things are looking quite a bit nicer so if i turn this on and off things are definitely just looking sh not, not really sharper but there's a lot more contrast, but in a very, very good way. It's not overpowering or anything like that. So the levels definitely did a good job of sort of adjusting the lights and the darks to make this look much, much better. Of course, we can affect the uh, the ones down here as well. But I'm not going to touch those too much because I'm pretty happy with the results we got from up here. Um, what I'm going to do now is add in a curves layer. And uh, right now in RGB, we can make a couple adjustments to this curve to do a very similar effect to what we did in the levels. So I'm going to click uh, sort of in the in the bottom third here and drag this down a little bit, not too far, like a very subtle change. And then up here and bring that up just to add a nice little curve here to the RGB and affect the overall color. Um, we're going to go into just the red channel now and do something very similar. So we're going to bring it up this time down here just to make it a bit more red where it's dark and then bring this down in the top. So where it's a bit brighter, we're going to have less reds. And uh, I like this scene being very warm. So I'm going to be doing that uh, with the blue as well, but the opposite. So bringing down the blues where it's more, more shadows. So it's a bit warmer there and bring the blues up where it's a bit brighter. And I'm not really going to touch the green channel for this one. So if we turn this one off, we should see we're getting a bit of a warmer color now. Uh, that's just because we we raised the reds where it's darker. Um, and the scene is overall more dark than anything else. So I'm really happy with that. And the last thing I want to add is hue and saturation. Now, sometimes your colors are a bit off and you just want to go into the hue and uh, move it. As you can see, we can go through this entire rainbow spectrum. I don't want to do anything too crazy, but... I am liking it a bit more when it's this kind of red at negative 14. I don't want to go that extreme though. I don't recommend going past like five or 10 tops. So at zero, it's looking a bit orangish. I don't know if I like that. So what I want to do is drag this maybe down to like minus five. I'm really liking the color on this. Uh, you can of course affect the saturation. Don't overdo it. Don't underdo it. Typically by default, it's pretty good. I am going to, let's see, do I want to raise it or drop it? Just the way it is right now isn't too bad, but I think I'm going to actually lower it by negative 10 just because I don't want the color of the wood to be too crazy because that's like the only thing that's actually um, colored overall. And then, of course, we can affect the brightness here. I feel like we made it a bit too dark when we were affecting the curves, so you can bring the brightness up a little bit as well. And if we turn this one on and off, as you can see, it's just more or less sort of like correcting the color and the lighting that we used before. So before we added these, it's looking okay, but it's pretty bland. But then we sort of punch things out a bit more with these colors and these these light lights and dark darks. And overall, I think that's looking a lot better that way. One of the last things I would do is probably open up my text tool. And um, just using like a basic white, I could write something like the poly count and just put it in a corner. But for this example, I'm just going to do like my initials or something like that, just for the sake of this tutorial. And just make sure it's white. And this is, of course, going to go above everything. So let's just put it in the corner here. Poly count is definitely a good thing to have written, though, uh, in each of your images. But of course, having a watermark or something to prevent people from stealing your work is also a great idea. Uh, and then just putting it on overlay is usually good enough. As you can see, super, super subtle, just with this basic setup. Um, just overlay on a white sort of text is good enough but essentially that's it that's kind of how i did all of my renders um just going back to my portfolio let's see where do i have it open oh it's on my other screen here that's pretty much how i did everything here and then i would just sort of put them together in a bunch of different angles pretty good looking stuff i i think obviously there's room for improvement but i'm pretty happy with how this looks at least way better than it was before um, and then essentially what we can do now is now that we have this all set up in Toolbag, we can get these 3D viewers, as I was mentioning earlier. And the way that we're going to do that is simply if we go up here to File, Export, Marmoset Set Viewer, uh, we can just sort of hit Export and we can name it whatever we want. But uh, we can sort of get this viewer now as a file. And if you drag that into things like ArtStation or a lot of other portfolio websites, you can actually have that 3D viewer I showed before. So I'm just going to hit Preview. And uh, I actually just got a file open over here. And as you can see, now we have it, but it's we're, we're in Google Chrome, essentially. We have all of our settings. We can look at our, our different channels here. 
So that's how you'd actually do that. Um, so essentially, yeah, file, export, moment set viewer, and you're gonna get that, that viewer, which is pretty sweet. So that's how you set up your renders and export a viewer. You can drag that into ArtStation, you're gonna have some good looking stuff, but that's exactly how I did all of my stuff. Um, it took quite a while because I had a decent amount of assets to go through, but I think it's a pretty good way to show your stuff off. Uh, like I said, the inspiration for this kind of work I will have in the description below because I mixed a couple ideas that I, that I found from people online. But uh, I really like this. It's really simple. It's a great way to show off multiple views at the same time. But uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hopefully you learned something awesome. Uh, I really like Toolbag. It's a great way to show off of your, uh, your game assets and stuff like that. I do it sometimes in the Unreal Engine, but this is just super, super simple. Really quick program to pick up and uh, learn a bunch of cool stuff. But um. If you guys enjoyed this video, a like on this video would be great. Share it around with people that you know who might actually benefit from this. But uh, anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully have some more tutorials out soon. But once again, my name has been Tie-Dye. Hopefully you enjoyed the video, and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.